Welcome to the third in this series of lectures on the topic of religious experience from the ordinary to the anomalous by Professor Wesley J. Wildman of the Boston University School of Theology. I'm Robert Neville, director of the Danielson Institute at Boston University, which hosts the lecture series with generous support from the Metanexus Foundation and Institute. Professor Wildman hails originally from Australia, where he took the undergraduate and master's degrees in mathematics and physics from Flinders University and in divinity from the University of Sydney. He holds the PhD in constructive and historical theology from the Graduate Theological Union at Berkeley, California, and has been at Boston University since 1993, where among other things, he heads the doctoral program in science, philosophy, and religion. He has published extensively in that tripartite field. In his first lecture, Professor Wildman put forward a philosophic framework for interpreting religious behavior, belief, and experience. In the second, he analyzed the current state of neurological studies of religion, asking what can be known about religious experience by studying the brain. Both of these lectures are available online and can be accessed through bu.edu slash Danielson slash research, or more simply through BU Universe. Professor Wildman's lecture tonight is entitled A Smorgasbord of Dangers and Delights. This is not a Swedish version of religious fun and games, not Ingmar Bergman's angst. The subtitle, which is the operative title, is The Phenomenology of religious experience. Professor Wildman will lecture again in this series on February 25th, March 17th, and April 14th of this next year. Before then, however, we will have guest lectures in this series on religious experience. Professor Jay Schulken of Georgetown University and the National Institutes of Health will lecture on January 28th, and Professor Ann Harrington of Harvard University will lecture on February the 4th. I hope that you can join us for all of these lectures. For now, may I ask you to sit toward the right-hand side of the room so that you can see the slides. Uh, Professor Wildman tells me that there's great art coming up, so you need to be able to see it. Let us welcome Professor Wesley Wildman to speak to us about a smorgasbord of dangers and delights, the phenomenology of religious experience. Professor Wildman. Well, lovely to see you all this evening. Thanks so much for coming out on a cold evening. And if you're a student, thanks so much for giving up your essay writing time to listen to what I hope will be an entertaining lecture for you. So let's get right to it. Religious and spiritual experiences are astonishingly diverse, far more varied than most people realise. Some of these phenomena are exciting, life-changing events. Some are mundane, everyday happenings. Some are devastating and terrifying. Some co-occur with psychologically anomalous experiences. Some are profoundly threatening to mental stability and to the fabric of life. In this lecture, I aim to give some indication of the diversity of religious and spiritual experiences. Now, I can only deal with this in a modest way because there is not enough time to dig deeply into the fascinating reports that form the raw data for reflection on this subject. But I will distinguish broad types of experiences from one another. I also aim to begin building a theoretical framework for explaining the value and functions of religious and spiritual experiences through the remaining lectures. Such a theory should have four characteristics. It should do justice to the vast variety of such experiences. It should register the structurally universal and contextually variable features of religious and spiritual experiences across cultures. It should have a plausible evolutionary framework and it should explain how religious and spiritual experiences have such potent existential significance. 
I shall attempt to satisfy both of those aims simultaneously by paying special attention to a particular subclass of religious and spiritual experiences, which I call intense experiences. These are simultaneously the most religiously potent and emotionally spectacular kinds of events that human beings experience. And thus they are particularly important for understanding the functions and effects of religion and spirituality in human lives and groups. They also appear to be the product of an evolutionarily stabilised capacity for intensity and thus are probably cross-culturally present within and beneath the exquisitely particular influences of local contexts and circumstances. This subclass of religious and spiritual experiences offers the framework needed to evaluate the value and the cognitive reliability, the nature and functions of religious and spiritual experiences. I aim to describe intense experiences and indicate their relationships to neighbouring types of experience. Now with that as the plan, let's proceed with the larger map within which we will situate intense experiences. To recall a famous title of Jonathan Z. Smith, a map is not the same as the territory it represents. If we get confused between the two, we may not be able to make sense of the territory that we come across. I have had this problem when orienteering, obsessively consulting my mistaken map for guidance, wasting precious minutes when I really should ignore the map and pay more attention to my surroundings. The map might be useful on the scale of hills and valleys and the basic geometry of paths, but at the level of details, all maps are misleading to various degrees, and most maps are distorted at the larger scales as well, representing a curved surface as a flat one for convenience, for example. In relation to religious and spiritual experiences, let's agree that here, too, maps can be useful, but that we should guard against confusing map with territory. The problem with famous phenomenological maps that is, famous descriptive maps that attempt to flush out the meaning of religious and spiritual experiences, is that we get attached to them and do not allow the phenomena we are considering to speak to us directly and perhaps freshly. So I will take care to explain the way that the map employs its basic terms. I shall use the term religious in a broad way to encompass the experiences that people have by virtue of being religious or being involved in religious groups. Involvement in religious groups is associated with a host of experiences from spectacular visions to mundane church picnics and Shabbat meals. They may be individual or corporate and they may support or disrupt ordinary social processes. The subset of religious experiences that are vivid and spectacular extends well beyond the borders of the officially religious and into a wealth of existentially loaded experiences from viewing a mind-blowing work of art to the aftermath of surviving a physical attack. I shall call the domain of existentially significant experiences ultimacy experiences because they engage us with our ultimate concerns. Obviously there is significant overlap between religious and ultimacy experiences. Now we come to that funny word spiritual. I use spiritual to encompass all of the ultimacy experiences and some of the domain of religious experiences and even those that are not of significance ultimately for people. When people say that they're spiritual but not religious, I take them to mean in part that the domain of ultimacy experiences extends beyond the religious, the officially recognised as religious. But Religious people also call themselves spiritual. They distinguish between spiritual and non-spiritual aspects of their religious involvement. So they are including as spiritual some matters that are not existentially ultimately significant. If you look at your diagram, that should help to make that clear. Some vivid experiences are also what psychologists call anomalous. That is, they are out of the ordinary to such an extent that they are shocking or disturbing, even when they are exciting and welcome, if they are. Anomalous experiences include a spectacular list. Hallucination, synesthesia, lucid dreaming, out-of-body alien abduction, anomalous healing, past life, near-death, psi-related and mystical experiences. They also include some of the mental phenomena associated with drug-induced mental altered states, psychiatric disorders, extreme circumstances, 
ecstatic states, group frenzy, fire walking, snake handling, and more marginally anomalous experiences such as dramatic self-deception and uncanny insight. Some anomalous experiences are ultimacy experiences, some are religious, some are both, and some are neither. Thus, the basic map we will be dealing with has three overlapping circles, one for each of anomalous, ultimacy, and religious experiences. Within this map, we can locate several other classes of experiences that have received extensive attention in the literature. The area of vivid human experiencing as experiences profiting from the most extensive phenomenological, physiological and neurological study has been and continues to be meditation experiences. South Asian and Buddhist traditions particularly include vastly elaborated distinctions of states of consciousness achieved in meditation. Meditation experiences may or may not be religious in nature but they are routinely both strange and significant which means that they are centered on the intersection between anomalous and ultimacy experiences. Now Western scientific research to evaluate claims about the therapeutic effectiveness of meditation has been going on for decades. Beginning in the 1970s in response to claims made on behalf of the powerful effects of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's technique of transcendental meditation, which dates back to 1958. Early research on meditation was first typically ignored and subsequently often attacked within mainstream medicine for methodological problems and bias. On the whole, I think those criticisms were well earned. Studies these days are often much better designed and cover many kinds of practices. One of the simplest meditation methods is that designed by Harvard physician Herbert Benson in 1975 to produce the so-called relaxation response. This method has the advantage of not necessarily being religious, which has made studying it seem more reputable within the medical community, though its presumption of powerful mind-body linkages still proves problematic for some critics. The 2006 publication of the Harvard Medical School Guide to Lowering Your Blood Pressure shows that there is now a broad, though I note not uncontested, consensus that Benson has established his claim that there is a relaxation response and that it can mitigate symptoms associated with stress-related illnesses. An impressively comprehensive survey of med meditation effects from within the field of experimental psychology is that of Jean Cristello. She has developed a multimodal developmental model to organise the relevant data. Cristello distinguishes six types of meditation effects, physical, cognitive, attentional, emotional, behavioural, relation to self, others, and spiritual. For each type, she then distinguishes between effects achieved early in the practice of meditation, those that require moderate meditation expertise, and those that tend to appear only for advanced practitioners. Together, the modal and the developmental axes constitute a two-dimensional grid upon which can be placed a host of recognised meditation effects. Apart from its intrinsic interest, Christella's model has significant value for clinical, psychological and medical intervention. For example, if impulse control or self-awareness is a problem for a client, then a clinical recommendation of meditation may be appropriate because increased impulse control and heightened self-awareness can be expected early in the process of developing meditation skills. Another class of much studied ultimacy experiences is mystical experiences. They lie at the triple intersection of ultimacy, that is significant, anomalous, that is strange, and religious experiences. The word mystical is reserved for experiences that are deliberately sought or experiences that occur spontaneously in the context of an ongoing effort to cultivate spiritual vitality or mastery. Mystical experiences have benefited from cross-cultural study more than any other religious and spiritual experiences, thanks to extensive literary traditions of mystical writings. The diversity of experience evident in mystic self-reports has provoked many distinctions that are supposed to do explanatory work and to furnish theological interpretations. Some of the more famous ones are W.T. Stace's distinction between introvertive and extrovertive types of mysticism, 
Anasi Zaina distinguished between theistic mysticism and monistic nature mysticism. Houston Smith proposed a fourfold set of mystical personality types corresponding to four ontological levels of reality. The terrestrial mystic who engages the depths of nature, the intermediate mystic who engages angels and demons and ghosts and discarnate entities, the celestial mystic oriented to relationship with the personal deity, and the infinite mystic oriented to sublime union with the ineffable God beyond God. These maps draw our attention to salient features of mystical experiences, but each map also mutes diversity or forces details to fit a conceptual scheme. In fact, mystical experiences display general patterns even as details defy those patterns. To detect the patterns, you have to abstract from the historical, environmental, social, cultural, linguistic and theological features of the operative context. But the existential power of mysticism only appears when the contextual details from diet to weather are kept in the interpretive picture. So we can do both abstract and concrete, but we have to know which we're doing and what we lose when we do one or the other, as well as what we gain. Now we come to intense experiences. This is a third class. Unlike mystical experiences, intense experiences are sometimes anomalous and sometimes not. Sometimes religious and sometimes not. But they are always spiritual experiences and always related, related to matters of ultimate concern. Intense experiences is a potentially confusing name. But there is an important distinction to be drawn here for which no name is currently in wide usage and thus the name I have selected will have to serve for now under the weight of the definition that I assign to it. To a neurologist, the adjective intense suggests high activation and thus may have nothing particular to do with existential significance. For example, the summer light in outback Australia can be blindingly intense in a way that seems to have nothing to do with existential significance, except indirectly as a source of metaphors for describing overwhelming experiences. By contrast with this, intense experiences involve both a high pitch of activation and also dense interconnection. That is, there is both depth and breadth of activation, and this is a meaningful, measurable neurological concept. Indeed, neurologist Mario Beauregard has measured both depth and breadth of brain activation in intense experiences with profound existential significance for his subjects. It is because of the breadth of activation that intense experiences connect typically separated thoughts and feelings and behaviours together into potentially all-encompassing interpretive frameworks. And they do it in such a way as to make normally separated aspects of life seem relevant to one another. So your moral ideas might suddenly be related to your metaphysics. Or a song that you heard on the radio might make you want to love your wife or your husband better. It is because of the strength of activation that such experiences of significant interconnectedness are emotionally powerful and often have behavioural consequences lasting long beyond the episode itself. By contrast with the neurologically focused character of intense experiences, religious experiences are a culturally variable and extremely diverse collection of distinct experiences serving different biological, social and existential purposes. I conjecture that the neural capacity for intensity in this breadth and depth sense is one of the evolutionary building blocks of religion. Along with pattern recognition, intentionality attribution, dissociability, hypnotizability and suggestiveness skills discussed in earlier lectures, the capacity for intensity prepared the way for the emergence of complex forms of religious experience. I shall refer to this as the intensity hypothesis. The intensity hypothesis possesses considerable initial plausibility. It is easy to appreciate how an organism's survival is aided by the embodied capacities to register an enormous amount of diverse information simultaneously, to be instantly aware of multiple meanings and possibilities for interpretation latent within that information, 
and still be able to synthesise the whole into an effective action plan so that you avoid dying. If the awareness of some information is not present, that is, if observational skills are weak, for example, or if appreciation of possible meanings is not present, that is, if inferential and interpretive skills are weak, then the organism is in danger of missing something crucial and selecting action plans that are unfavourable for survival. Similarly, in the context of communicative environments and sexual reproduction, it is not difficult to imagine that greater levels of observation and awareness make a potential mate, on average, more sensitive and intelligent and more attractive as a friend and as a partner in the grand adventure of rearing offspring. So these selection pressures at the levels of simple survival and access to reproductive opportunities are well understood and are key parts of the standard evolutionary explanations for the emergence of intelligence. But the implications of this for understanding intense experiences are not appreciated as widely as they should be. The capacity for intense experiences may or may not be directly selected, but it is at least a side effect of directly selected cognitive skills of perception, inference, interpretation and information-guided decision-making. What in mundane forms produces awareness of meaning sufficient to guide safe and smart behaviour can also take on particularly intense forms with cognitively overwhelming and existentially loaded qualities. Now, after recognising its initial plausibility, we immediately wonder how we can test the claim of this intensity hypothesis about the evolutionary stabilisation of the capacity for intense experiences. While not a simple matter of evidence, such tests are being designed and carried out using especially the quantitative methods for studying religious and spiritual experiences that I sketched briefly in the last lecture. So I won't go over that again now. In five to ten years, we will know enormously more than we do at present about the evolutionary status of all aspects of religious behaviours, beliefs and experiences. If the intensity hypothesis is borne out, we will have a strong argument that the neural capacity for intensity comes early in our evolutionary history and that our religious and spiritual experiences elaborate this basic capacity as well as the other basic cognitive and emotional capacities of the brain that I mentioned. This has striking implications for philosophical and theological interpretation. Just to name one, it makes everything in reality potentially religiously or spiritually significant and not merely those things so deemed by the authority of religious groups. Intense experiences answering approximately to this description have been of enormous interest to scholars of religion. They sense that this is one of the power sources for generating religious beliefs, convictions, practices. Human beings are a species whose members' subjective lives and social behaviours are deeply entangled in a variety of ways. Personal experience, social connections, entangled. Intense experiences command the attention of almost every person who has them. Intense experiences occur unpredictably, diversely, and with wide varies of frequency in populations. Most people have intense experiences, though they are not necessarily comfortable calling them religious experiences and may in fact be in some respects in tension with their understanding of religion so that they feel the need to be quiet about them in their religious contexts. Intense experiences often provoke religious interest, conviction and activity and function as sources for justification for every aspect of religious belief and behaviour. Intense experiences often serve as touchstones for a person's self-interpretation. They are so powerful, they can dominate what the social environment dictates. Intense experiences can provoke cognitive dissonance and so can be avoided, feared, marginalised in the construction of personal self-interpretations. Intense experiences occur to people on a spectrum of mental health from the desperately ill to the optimally healthy. Intense experiences range along a spectrum of affect from the pleasant and important to the terrifying and repellent. Intense experiences lie along a spectrum of intention from occurring spontaneously to only occurring because cultivated. Wisdom traditions include techniques for refining the ability to have intense experiences more often and more potently. People sometimes ingest chemicals to induce intense experiences both within and beyond established religious traditions. 
The recurrence of certain types of tense, intense experiences strengthens judgments of their importance and meaningfulness. If it happens again, it means more. Intense experiences that are recurrent, intelligible and desirable within a group can consolidate that group's identity. A great example would be speaking in tongues in Pentecostal churches. The intense Experience of people, the intense experiences of people without access to a wisdom tradition for guidance are sometimes difficult to assimilate because they simply have no framework at all for making sense of them. Now, this list hints at the diversity of intense experiences and their existential and social importance. The map I have elaborated situates the entire class of those experiences in relation to other major classes of experience. If the intensity hypothesis is correct, intense experiences have cross-cultural relevance and studying them opens the way to a species-wide understanding of the nature and functions of religious and spiritual experiences. For that larger project, keeping the diversity of intense experiences and their relationships with allied experiences clearly in mind is absolutely crucial. Oversimplification is always the enemy of sophisticated understandings of human nature. With that warning in mind, as well as the lure of the larger theoretical venture in mind, the next step is to dig more deeply and complexly into intense experiences, and in a particular way that identifies the significance and value of intense experiences. What follows then is a phenomenology of intensity. I begin with a discussion of three impulses or pressures that express our immediate response to intense experiences. I then present the five common core elements of intensity, which I dub depth, horizon, scale, complexity and mystery. If you'll forgive me, there are some personal stories here. <coughs> One mid-November morning some years ago, I made my first visit to the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. The design was unsettling with the path plunging into the ground before arcing through and back up and out again. The mass of names, a veritable horde of them, swarmed around me as I slowly paced this gash in the earth. A young man traced a name on the wall. A few children were playing a short distance away. I could hear cries of catch it and teasing and laughter as I walked. Though it was not part of my experience, I thought of the controversy surrounding the Vietnam War. I had heard stories of people losing lifelong friends, ministers being run out of churches and parents alienated from their own children, all because of their different perspectives on the war. I had seen films of crowds surrounding returning US soldiers, some shouting baby killer, and a few even spitting on the fortunate who survived. I had read about the difficulty that returning soldiers had in reintegrating themselves into the fabric of society and the high psychic cost of the war, both for veterans and for the nation here as a whole. I pondered the sense of humiliation that burdened and perhaps still burdens some in the United States about the war. For some, this humiliation was about not being able to stop communism from spreading in Vietnam. For others, it was about the policeman role the US and its allies played in deciding what should happen in Southeast Asia. For still others, it was about losing a war to which the armies allied with the North Vietnamese were so committed that their human losses alone were probably an order of magnitude greater than those of the armies allied with the South Vietnamese. For yet others, it was about the undignified way in which public debate about the war was conducted across the US the shameful way that courageous American soldiers were treated and the political short-sightedness of anti-war sentiment. Plenty of humiliation to go around. I thought of my country of origin, Australia, going to war on its Southeast and Asian neighbour as an act of loyalty to its gargantuan cross-Pacific ally. The confusion about the war in Australia was complicated by other factors. <clears throat> Australians were one step further removed from the war than the US public, for whom the spread of communism was a more prominent issue, one more clearly worth fighting about. Yet Australians bordered Southeast Asia and had to concern themselves with regional developments. 
and the US Navy and Marines had come to the rescue during the Second World War as Japanese troops headed south towards New Guinea and Australia. A country with memories of the rank incompetence of British commanders causing the pointless deaths of thousands on the shores of Turkey in the First World War, however, is always anxious when serving the interests of an ally, even when it has its own interests at stake. I thought of Vietnam. I had never been there and had not then seen the shocking figures on Vietnamese casualties of the war, but I knew about the defoliance, the horrific fate of some small villages, and resentment toward the interfering West. I knew about Vietnam's reputation as a paradise and how the war dramatically changed the landscape, at least for a while. I thought about the grief over lost children affecting many more Vietnamese families than in the United States and its allies combined, rumbling through the generations as such unrelenting sorrow does. These thoughts drifted through me as I walked the path. They were registered wordlessly as feelings rather than as a series of thoughts. This wordlessness was the only way to let the furiously diverse perspectives on the war coexist in my imagination. I was silent for a long time afterwards. Just as I did not speak for more than a day after seeing the film Gallipoli, which is a retelling of some of the most tragic events of the Great War remembered ever after in Australia and New Zealand on Anzac Day, so I stayed silent for the rest of the day as I wandered about Washington. This silence was no ritual act of respect to the fallen. At least it was not primarily that. Mostly it was an attempt to allow the enormity of the events space to breathe in my imagination. An airspace that would close off as soon as words began to intrude, which they would all too soon. This pressure to silence was strong then and welcome. It is always welcome. It has the dimensions of home and the colours of winter. It is the full silence of thick windless snowfall. It is fire in the half relief, relief from the harsh, time-bound linearity of language. It is an anti-social withdrawal from inane chattering, which in that state grates on my nerves and includes almost everything spoken or written. It is restful then, but tinged both with a patient grief that anticipates the inevitability of science, silence broken and with a slightly desperate vigilance. When in such moods, my entry is unpredictable. It might be a smile and a courteous, simple reply to a child's question, or it might be a selfishly savage attempt to defend my silent habitation, which of course is instantly destroyed by so harsh a move. These days, I try to smile. Looking back on that emotional journey through the war memorial and rethinking the remembered currents of the stream of my consciousness at that time, I am impressed by an abiding conviction, namely that a rational piecing together of these perspectives on the Vietnam War would be in bad taste. Floating above the silent flow of the river of feelings and ignoring the paddling option of thinking things out now seems to have been absolutely necessary for the significance of that experience, for its intensity, to have had a chance of sinking in, of transforming me, of being honoured in me. The intensity of things sometimes conjures the pressure to silence. Rushing upwards from the unfathomable depth of our experiences, the pressure to silence engulfs us, we who are blessed with such a facility for language that we are used to being able to say almost anything to the point of being cavalier, unknowing victims of linguistic hubris. The shock of the pressure to silence is partly surprise at the sudden unmasking of language as a sinister adjunct to a subtle social habit of using language to paper over the painful intensity of things. This habit lulls us into a flatly comfortable world defined by predictability and coloured merely by aspirations for relatively harmless, well-controlled excursions into the terrible and the blissful and other extremities. The pressure to silence is also about the need to acknowledge the failure of something. This might be the failure of language to capture that which we wish to express, but this mis risks misdescribing the situation as having chiefly to do with expressibility. It is perhaps more centrally the failure of the will to express. 
Whenever making the effort to speak, the intensity of our experience strikes us as futile, as a distraction from action, as imprudent or immodest, as distasteful or dangerous, we are liable to be pressed to silence. Poets might dare to speak under such circumstances, but poetry is all the more dangerous for its hazardous aspirations, its winking disruption of the blanket of calm warmth that language wraps around our societies. All of these considerations are independent of the question of whether we can express everything we can think, with or without the aid of specialised languages and expert discourse, discourse communities that maintain them. From this it follows that the pressure to silence is not one thing in every instance, but rather is complex and shaped by context. Unsurprisingly then, it is also constrained by the intensity that evokes it. Well, feeling the pressure to silence and yielding to it in situations like the one I have described is my typical way, and I know that it is not the only way. I vividly recall a car trip back to Krakow after visiting, visiting Auschwitz and Birkenau, a far more overwhelming experience about which I dare not speak at all, a very different sort of pressure to silence than the one I felt at the Vietnam War Memorial. That return journey was filled with the agonised and highly intellectual verbal processing of a friend. He was struggling to come to terms with what he had seen. I was suffocating for want of silence, even as my friend yielded to another pressure, familiar to me only in more mundane situations, to talk it out, to think it through. Though I suspect that my friend was as desperate for comfort as I was, the ways we responded to the existential crush and went about getting what we needed were quite different. <clears throat> we human beings are such diverse creatures. One seeks to defer, defer to the intense through silence, while another bends the full power of intellect to a similar goal. In fact, both the pressure to speak and the pressure to silence are familiar to most people, and it is probably a blend of circumstances and personal style that determines which is activated. There's a strange relationship between the pressure to silence and the pressure to speak. Apophatic mystical writers embrace the paradox, whereas their self-appointed task is to describe an object of experience that drives the mind away from familiar categories and words towards something like undifferentiated unity or perfect emptiness. The medium available to them for expressing the idea of such experiences and for maintaining traditions of such expression is words. The paradox is obvious in the stating, but prodigiously subtle in the outworking. The stresses induced in language by the end that apophatic mystical writers force it to serve are extreme. The great exponents of such writing have been similarly extreme in the creative production of techniques for getting the point across, without vitiating the infinitely delicate final goal. Some have analysed many of these techniques at the level of syntax and grammar, there are also techniques at the level of symbol systems, such as balancing mechanisms and conceptual trajectories, and techniques depending on the historical play of symbolic transformations. The question to be asked in light of these phenomena is this. Why do apophatic mystics bother to speak at all? Why not allow the pressure to silence free reign and just stop talking about such matters? Well, some do embrace silence in just this way. Some members of silent religious orders are one example, and another might be those Sufis who cultivate disciplined, joking, story-telling evasions of talk about ultimate matters. Mystical writers do not choose these paths, however, because they experience a pressure to speak that is powerful enough to compete with the pressure to silence that their writings describe. <coughs> Note that this has nothing to do with the via negativa or the via positiva, both of which are ways of speaking, that are paths towards conceiving God, and ultimately toward differently modulated silences. Now what I'm talking about has to do with the irrepressible motivation of mystical writers. Most apophatic mystical writers manage to intensify the paradox of their bothering to speak at all by speaking mostly of the pressure to silence and saying little about the pressure to speak. Yet it is the pressure to speak of the pressure to silence and that which provokes it that drives them into the position of intense creativity that makes their writing so memorable. 
So what then is the pressure to speak? By way of contrast, consider that there is a generalised habit <clears throat> among human beings of speaking for diverse purposes and with effects of varying value. This is a biologically basic side effect of a triple correlation, the development of vocal tract physiology, the creation of systems of language, <clears throat> and the evolution of the neural capacity for symbolic reference and other requirements of language. The pressure to speak as I mean it here refers not to this more or less unrestricted urge, however interesting it is, and it really is fascinating, but to something every bit as distinctive and complex as the pressure to silence. The pressure to speak derives from this basic capacity for language as a specialised response to extraordinarily intense conditions. My friend in the car trip away from Auschwitz and Birkenau felt one form of this pressure to speak. The poet experiences another. The prophet is driven by another. And the scholarly inquirer is subject, as I am here, to yet another. Each develops special techniques as subtle as those of mystical writers for speaking about that which, when felt most intensely, is difficult or impossible to capture in words and can even defeat the desire to speak. The poets play with language and become the high adventurers of trope. The inquirers create specialised discourses and cultivate traditions of knowledge. The prophets battle beneath the interminable wet blanket of oppressive social convention with masterful rhetoric. The worshippers speak and sing in ritualised ways whose expressive and transformative power finally turns more on blessed repetition than on cognitive content. These specific forms of the pressure to speak are distinguishable from the more generalised urge to speak by context. Just as things show up as differently intense in different contexts, so human beings experience the pressures to respond in silence or by speaking to that intensity. Now, the third and final immediate response to intensity that I'll be discussing is the pressure to move. Distinguishing the pressure to speak from the pressure to silence seems to demand that we distinguish between the pressure to move and the pressure to stillness. Indeed, there's a point to that, but we comprehend stillness as a kind of movement. So in what I'm going to say, the possibility of no motion is registered in the idea of movement. The evolutionary context is the most promising framework within which to interpret human movement. The neural hardwiring for movement refined in the evolutionary process is our inheritance. Our central nervous system has everything from distributed processing that provokes the withdrawal from danger without having to waste time in centralised cognitive processing, to a flight response that triggers such cognitive confusion that the direction of our movement is as unknown to us as it is unpredictable to a dangerous foe. Our species has an enormous range of instinctive movements, from means of locomotion to facial expressions. We have formidable dexterity that, combined with our cognitive abilities, allows us to compensate for relative weaknesses in the strength and agility departments with tools and culture by means of which we can organise ourselves to penetrate and usually dominate most of our planetary home's diverse ecosystems. Our movement is geared to emotional states almost as much as to perception and cognition. We feel through moving and move in response to feeling in an incredibly fine-tuned feedback process. Without it, we could never master the perpetual tumbling that is walking, nor learn to balance well enough to move in any other way, nor figure out how to compensate for our endlessly moving sense organs so as to stabilise perception. Our brains develop in the early years on the basis of complex hardwired connectivity of feedback processes among perception, emotion and movement toward a prodigiously subtle set of finely adjusted neural connections that make all of our movements possible, from the subconscious rhythm of breathing and other autonomic bodily processes to the masterful elegance of the dancer or the breathtaking power of the sportsman. Indeed, the very aesthetic criteria by which we assess beauty, economy and elegance of movement themselves derive from this same conjoining of hard wiring and learning that makes us able to move and to recognise movement in others via mirror neurons. Nothing makes this clearer than those mirror neurons. They cause our brains to react to the perception of moving human beings 
in the same way that our own brains would fire if we ourselves were moving, save that the other neural processes necessary for activating neuromuscular um, circuits do not occur. We appreciate the movements of others literally by experiencing them to some degree in our own minds. This is how we judge beauty of movement, as well as estimate the motivations and intentions associated with the movements we see. So, it is no wonder that we have characteristic impulses to move when we undergo intense experiences. Of course, speech is a special kind of movement, and the pressure to silence and the pressure to speak have been described. Beyond this, however, the pressure to move is an extremely powerful impulse. It is a visceral reaction to intensity that manifests itself in an enormous variety of ways. From sitting quietly and alert, to the furious movement of limbs and torso in wild dancing, from the violent physical outburst to the joyous sprint and leap. All of these mystical movements, all of these physical movements are modulated by cognitive considerations. For example, prudence may determine that one's anger be expressed in a white-hot stare rather than a bodily assault. And a cultured environment may determine that a subtle hand movement enters a bid at an auction even though such a movement would not be noticed elsewhere. One group may interpret falling down in a religious act of worship in a most positive light, whereas another group might read such movement as a medical emergency. The diverse range and contextual variations of movement makes correlations with intense experiences difficult to tease out. We are significantly in the dark because so little research has been done on this topic. Yet something ought to be said, if only to raise consciousness about the importance of associations between feeling and movement that play such a vital role in responding to intense experiences. Now with that we come to the five core features of intense experiences. One reason that the intensity of experience has the variety of, inter of immediate effects that I've just described, modulations of the pressures to silence, to speak and to move, is that intensity has more than one face. In fact, it has at least five, depth, horizon, scale, complexity and mystery. The intensity hypothesis involves supposing that these five elemental aspects of intensity separately or jointly achieved stabilisation in the far evolutionary past. Now some of these five words will be very familiar. They have fascinating lineages in the phenomenology and philosophy of religion and also in theology. In particular, depth, horizon and mystery are terms partially stabilised by existing discussions in the phenomenology of religion or in philosophical theology. You think of Tillich or Rana or even Heidegger. Scale and complexity as used here may be less familiar ideas. Attending to the spiritual insights of scientists in their work invites the introduction of the phenomenologically tuned metaphor of complexity. And the metaphor of scale enables us to distinguish the familiar mystical experience of oceanic calm from the experience of depth, which are subtly but importantly different. I shall proceed to describe all of this by building a conceptual bridge between the immediate effects or pressures of intensity, the pressure to speak, to silence, to move, and these five power sources or faces of intensity. How should this descriptive task proceed? Well, first notice that it's the different qualities of the pressure to silence, to speak and to move that serve as the first level justification for a nominological distinction among five faces of intensity. It is the modulations of these pressures that convey the colour and character of intensity in human experience. Without these pressures, these reactions to intensity and their modulations, it will be difficult to make a case for the internal geography of intensity. Thus I shall attempt to describe these five faces of intensity by means of their inscription in intense experiences in the form of characteristic associations with the three pressures. Second, each of the five core experiences has significance in other ways besides the pressures they evoke, but less definitively. Thus I will describe each with reference to its correlation with human feelings and activities, its typical manifestations in social institutions and ritual processes, and its links to well-recognised forms of spiritual practice. A third level of description, and this is the third of four, 
is the stability of this phenomenology of intense experience across cultures, eras, personalities and mental characteristics. That I cannot, firm, that I cannot formally test here, but my limited exposure to the cortex and motifs of world religious traditions has guided the description and will continue to correct it. A fourth and final level of description and evidence is neurological. I hope that evidence will be forthcoming in support of the corollary of the intensity thesis that the five core features of intensity have different neurological expression and were jointly or individually stabilised in the evolutionary process. For now, I must res rely principally on the first two of these four levels of description, that is phenomenological levels of description. And I have to subordinate the comparative and the neurological levels. We simply don't know enough about it. So, depth. Depth is registered in feelings of intense fear, joy or bliss. Associated mental states typically have no direct object. The primary activity invited is that of surrender, with consciousness of being at the mercy of something that may or may not be worthy of trust, but which is trusted nonetheless, inevitably. This is the import of Yahweh placing Moses in the cleft of the rock for his protection, or David dancing in the temple and Shiva dancing in destruction across the face of the earth. In such situations, our ultimate environment shows up as deadly, yet gracious. Although there is absolutely no rational reason to believe that grace can be counted on in the situation. Thus, surrender is the natural response. This is the founding experience of grace in religious life, regardless of the doctrinal framework furnished for it. Attempts to understand are irrelevant in this state. No social structures are associated with the recurrence of these kinds of feelings, but in small communities the achievement of this awareness is prized and rewarded with admiration and respect. Liturgy registers the reality of this experience of depth in praise, whether verbally or musically, and more especially in adoration where the particular cognitive content of what is, what is said or sung fades, unlike in praise, allowing something akin to a blissful trance state to predominate. Repetition of songs and mantras, as well as rhythmic techniques, can help relativise cognitive content on the way to such states of consciousness. The pressure to silence associated with the experience of depth is that of surrender to fear and bliss, which involves the prohibition of pretenses to control such as language typically connotes. The pressure to speak associated with the experience of depth is that of playful babbling, incoherent singing, glossolalia, screaming, mumbling, the forms of speaking that deconstruct the illusion of control associated with the cognitive grasp of language. The pressure to move is especially interesting here. The experience of, dance, of depth seems to be the consistent inspiration for solo dancing and trance dancing. Second, horizon is registered in feelings associated with recognising difference, such as fascination, alienation, fear, disgust or hate. The experience of horizon can be aggressively internalised as failure to recognise oneself or part of one's body, with the associated sense of panic or violation. It can also be spectacularly externalised into powerful senses of presence, which may be hostile or benign. The mental states in which horizon is realised always have objects and thus are intentional states, but the objects may be either diffuse or specific. The primary activity associated with horizon is engagement, which can cover everything from defending and fighting to dialoguing and flirting. Understanding this response involves interpretation, comparison and dialogue. Politics is the institutional sphere in which the recurrence of this experience in human life is most directly registered. And the typical social form that presupposes it is the group that represents special interests. There are legitimation processes associated with any group's perpetuation and function. The legitimation processes of special interest groups are essentially ideological and self-protective. Liturgy responds to the prevalence of this human experience with confession, intercession, supplication. 
Consciousness of ourselves and our own pain and interests and concerns is centralised in such liturgical acts, but they also engage us with the other as essential to our own well-being. The pressure to silence associated with the experience of horizon is that of fearful and fascinated recognition of difference, a pregnant silence in which words are necessary yet all words premature. When engagement demands the breaking of the dangerous silence, the pressure to speak takes the form of the language of politics, words that serve the end of surviving and thriving, diplomacy, prophecy, negotiation, rhetoric, persuasion. These special kinds of verbal dance are akin to the pressure to move evoked in experiences have arisen as dancing, flirtatious dancing, body grinding dancing, teasing dancing, the ballroom tango, the candle-lit balcony waltz of lovers. Third, scale is registered fundamentally in feelings of awe, which can involve oceanic calm or the anxiety of agoraphobia, vastness or emptiness, and which leads out into feelings of benevolence, compassion, wideness of heart, or loss of self. The panoramic appreciation of the nature mystic is typically dominated by scale. The natural world becomes vast and all-encompassing, abundantly fertile and creative, from the very large to the very small, and from the very far to the very near. The feeling of emptiness is correlated with this feeling of vastness because as the appreciation of the vastness of reality widens, the filtering of that reality through personal interests lessens to the point that utterly succulent, vivid awareness coincides with emptiness of self. While intense experiences of scale are sometimes terrifying and can skittle psychic stability, they can also induce peacefulness, equanimity and wideness of heart. It is just as the Buddha taught, the realisation of vastness, emptiness, evinces compassion. For the reason that everything is related in an all-encompassing vista, so that my interests are viscerally experienced as merged with those of every being everywhere. The mental states associated with experiences of scale are typically objectless as with experiences of depth. But experiences of scale are distinguishable from experiences of depth in two ways. The feelings involved and the basic urge is no longer to surrender as in depth but to behold, an utterly selfless reaction to behold. As with experiences of depth, attempts to understand experiences of scale are irrelevant because they interfere with beholding. No social institutions exist in specific recognition of the prevalence of experiences of scale. Both they and experiences of depth are essentially deconstructive impulses within human social life, unmasking self-protection and mocking clever legitimation strategies. Liturgy responds to the presence of experiences of scale in human life with songs of grandeur, with heart-stoppingly glorious architecture, with awe-inspiring language. The pressure to silence in this case prohibits words in the name of making us small so that the universe can expand in our imaginations, consuming us. The pressure to speak, meanwhile, shows itself as unselfconscious, rippling laughter on the way to speaking om when it is the word that comprehends and evokes all. Yielding to the pressure to move in this case leads to dancing alone among trees, dancing alone under the stars, running in trains of hand-holding friends, streaming like wind gusts across grassy hills, or else sitting quietly in the open-bodied lotus position. Fourth. Complexity is registered in feelings of confusion, disorientation, irritation, surprise and wonder. A mental state in which complexity is dominant has an object. The object might swarm around us as the world does for the airplane pilot in twisting freefall. Or else the complexity of this object might be newly noticed, evincing oohs and ahs and stimulating curiosity. The primary activities associated with experiences of complexity have to do with the satisfaction of curiosity, the relief of confusion, and the solving of problems, 
all of which lead out into serious attempts to control and understand that which irritates or provokes curiosity. <clears throat> Understanding in this case involves inquiry and associated activities of model building, experimenting, testing and exploring. Liturgy addresses the prevalence of experiences of complexity with the reading and exposition of sacred texts, with educational and inspirational public speaking, and with moments of pastoral care. There are many social institutions whose reasons for existence depend on the recurrence of experiences of complexity, from educational and research institutions with explicit mission, missions to understand, to family and community institutions implicitly devoted to controlling the problematically complex environment of human life. These institutions protect and provide resources for solving theoretical and practical problems, for comforting the confused, orienting the lost, and soothing the irritated, and for giving free rein to wonder and curiosity. It is here that human beings are at their creative best, transforming overwhelming confusion into social arrangements that steady the spinning world, and inventing technologies that control and alter the environment for human life. This describes the pressure to speak, but the pressure to silence hovers nearby. We are driven to respectful silence by wonder. The cell under the microscope, Jupiter's moons through a telescope, a finely tuned ecosystem, or the proof of Pythagoras' theorem of right-angled triangles. We are compressed into silence by the suffocating confusion of complex problems, the fair distribution of food on planet Earth, the endlessly rebellious teenager, the inner workings of our own minds, or the way long chains of amino acids are reliably folded into the same shaped protein. In no sphere of intense experiences does the pressure to silence yield so quickly to the pressure to speak. But the pressure to silence hovers beneath and at the boundaries of human confusion and our prodigious efforts to solve problems. Now the pressure to move in this case is as powerful as the pressure to speak. It gives rise to making, moulding and crafting, poking, prodding and exploring looking under, around and through, weighing, testing, measuring, finding out, finding more, finding it, researching, recording, rethinking, retracing steps. The whirlwind of movement spins as fast as the words flow. So finally, mystery. Mystery is registered in feelings of ignorance and incomprehension. Whereas the experience of complexity yields to curiosity through positioning the object as a tractable problem, the experience of mystery involves being stopped in one's tracks. The object in this case always seems diffuse, beyond our control, cognitively impenetrable. This is so whether or not the object really can, with right effort and skillful means, be specified, controlled, understood. The primary activity associated with mystery is reverence which involves recognising that the mystery must be set apart and made holy. Attachment to mystery is common, which leads to rationalising its incomprehensibility by distinguishing between secular and sacred, creating rules that protect the sacred and defend it from incursions of the curious, and delineating ritual space and time within which the mystery can be savoured with proper reverence. Religious institutions are the social forms that most directly recognise the recurrence of experiences of mystery in human life. Ritual, sacrament, vestment, symbol are the lifeblood of the liturgical recognition of mystery. Hierarchy and authority are the concomitants of institutionalising commitment to the defence of mystery. Hierarchical authority can be used to suppress and resist incursions of the curious by framing them as lacking the requisite appreciation and respect for the mystery and carelessly trampling on that which deserves reverence. Reverence is enormously captivating. At the heart of institutionalised religion lies, lies not merely Nietzsche's priest cruelly sucking the life out of the weak and dependent, but also people captivated by mystery, at times perhaps obsessive like the desperate lover, but revering that which is more valuable to them as mysterious than as comprehended. And though many former mysteries have proved to be tractable for inquiry in recent centuries, 
the primal mystery of our existence remains, undergirding all life and evincing reverence from all who sense it. The pressure to silence in this case is the silence of reverence. Whereas the silent wonder of complexity yields quickly to the chatter of inquiry, the silence of reverence is difficult to interrupt for lack of any motivation to do so. The pressure to speak in this case is driven by the needs of sacrament and liturgy, authority and legitimation. The pressure to move here is the power source for ritual, for the raising of the hands just so, for the pouring of the milk just so, for the delicately tuned timber and inflection of voice, the simple but elegant economy of movement, the impeccably careless casting of rose petals. The functions of intensity. These five core features of intensity are deeply present in human nature. While the associations with emotions and kinds of activity that I have as sketched are not strict, the links are highly suggestive. The allure of intense experiences consists in the conviction it produces, the courageous acts it inspires, the orientation it affords, the identity it forges, and the social belonging that it empowers. It is because of this lure that intensity is the finest and most useful human addiction. But intensity is more or less useful, more or less productive, depending on how it arises, how we cultivate it, how we encounter it. There are many ways that intensity arises and a variety of paths for cultivating it. I'm going to describe three of these before concluding. Very briefly. First, the least deliberate encounters with intensity are wholly unexpected, often shocking and deeply impressive, for better or worse. They can hit like a bolt from the blue or gradually overwhelm like a rising tide. They can convert, break habits, change behaviour overnight. They can produce life-defining insights, generate scientific hypotheses and inspire fabulous works of art and architecture. They can drive obsessions, fragment personalities and create suicidal despair. They can be welcome, like surprise birthdays or blissful moments of repose, or terrifying like a close encounter with violent death or witnessing a great horror. An unexpected brush with intensity may never occur again, or it may initiate a cascade of experiences that defines a whole new chapter of our lives. A second kind of encounter with intensity is by means of self-medication. There are a host of religious and wisdom traditions in which entheogens are used to induce intense experiences. These entheogens range from LSD to mushrooms, and the practices associated with them to find close-knit communities even today, often operating secretly for fear of persecution or legal prosecution. Beyond spiritual traditions, drugs from alcohol to narcotics are employed to bring on intense experiences, though typically these seem to be of little lasting value, even as judged by those who use them. Communities that cultivate the regular use of entheogens, by contrast, treat self-medication as a sacramental act that cleanses the doors of perception, in the words of Houston Smith, and opens the mind to ontologically real worlds that are usually unreachable by means of ordinary experience, stimulating acts of remembering, refueling, reorienting. A third kind of encounter with intensity is characterised by determined self-cultivation. Self-cultivation here involves the deliberate formation of habits of spiritual and artistic expertise, and the expert among us on this particular topic is Nat Barrett. Its fruit is virtuosity in a host of forms. The phenomenon of virtuosity reaches across fields from music to athletics, from compassion to meditation. Virtuosity is a highly cultivated form of intensity that expresses many of the five dimensions simultaneously in a way that is possible only through rigorous training and focused thought. Degrees of virtuosity vary from reflexive spontaneity, as in randomness where you have no control, <laughs> through cultivation in disciplines and practices where one gains control, to a sophisticated spontaneity where control is so great that exceptional creativity becomes possible. In most cases, the functional effects of intensity are socially enabled, channeled and regulated. These social connections magnify the impact of intense experiences from the domain of individual existence 
to the economic and political spheres, thereby giving enormous leverage to the convictions and awareness that intense experiences inspire. Now, in conclusion, I'm going to make three promissory notes about the coming lectures. They're all connected to intense experiences. This will help you know what's coming. First, the theological and philosophical significance of intense experiences is a hotly debated topic. Their evolutionary stabilisation makes it clear why. If the evolutionary process has contrived directly or indirectly to equip almost all human beings with the capacity for intense experiences, then surely they must be at least somewhat analogous with our evolved capacities for sensory experiences. And if our sensory experience is generally reliable, then perhaps we should regard the cognitions prompted by intense experiences to be generally reliable also. In other words, perhaps the evolutionary stabilisation of intense experiences offers a way to lay our hands on one of the confessional theologians' holy grails, namely a way to demonstrate the rational soundness of their religious beliefs. Having prepared carefully to ask and answer this question in this and previous lectures, I shall pick it up in the next lecture, entitled, Can You Trust Your Instincts? Second, the evolutionary stabilisation of the capacity for intensity should be directly relevant to understanding the production of the feelings and convictions that inspire and rationalise religious behaviours and beliefs. Religious and spiritual experiences are not only beautiful and valuable, but also potentially dangerous. People's failure to understand the gap between beliefs that potent experiences seem to make self-evidently true and beliefs that are rationally well supported is a problem of terrible proportions in human history. Nothing expresses the tragedy of religious and spiritual experiences more acutely or compactly than the phenomenon of conversion at the point of a sword or a scimitar when it is wielded by a human being who acts out of absolute conviction with heart full of compassion for the lost soul under the threat of death and with a visceral feeling of divine confirmation and command. To understand how all of this works, we need to understand the evolutionary roots of the intense experiences that forge potent convictions and magnify them in religious and political groups. That is the major aspect of the fifth lecture in this series on the social embedding of religious and spiritual experiences. Third, the evolutionary stabilisation of the capacity for intensity also means that there should be possible technologies of control to induce and modify and also prevent intense experiences. Now, group-based technologies have been used for centuries, as have practices related to food, sex and meditation. More precise medical and neurological technologies appear to be just around the corner, and indeed some are already with us. What does this imply for the meaning of religious and spiritual experiences for them to come under our, uh, under our control? That is the topic of the final lecture in this series on religious and spiritual experiences and the longer range future. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Wildman. We have time for a few questions. I will re remind you that the lectures are being recorded for later broadcast and for archiving, so please wait until you actually have the microphone in front of your mouth before speaking. I detect the pressure towards silence. Hi, that was really interesting. I'd like to hear more about the mystery aspect of your talk and um, the pressure that you think people feel towards mystery. Um, I often, as a college professor who teaches psychology, I often uh, feel a lot of frustration when I feel that my undergraduates are wallowing in the mystery, which for me means wanting to study really odd, bizarre, abnormal, things but not really try to understand them, just wallow in them. So I, I just want to learn, I'm interested in this topic, I want to learn more, thanks. Yeah. Um, 
Wallowing, of course, at a certain age is merely intellectual laziness. So, and our job is to um, teach students that they come to college not to be lazy, but to work hard and learn. So we crack the whip and we force them to learn stuff. But um, in its more uh, uh, advanced social forms, there is a powerful resistance to curiosity associated with mystery. This defence of mystery is one of the reactions, one of the pressures to speak that people have. Um, you don't want anything to interfere with the reverent attitude. And in order for it to remain reverent, it must not become an object of curiosity. And if someone starts speaking in an inquiring way about the object of reverence, they threaten to transform it into a tractable object of curiosity. And the effect of that is destroying the very thing to which you are most attached. So religious institutions have quite elaborate mechanisms for um, doing what your students do with you, for pressuring you away from making them curious, except they're doing it in a way which is, of course, sometimes quite deadly and at other times extremely uh, uh, harmful to people who have natural curiosity. Um, now, of course, there's a good way to do everything and a bad way to do everything, so I'm not attacking mystery, but I am pointing out that its role in human life, and particularly in religious groups, is uh, it has that kind of shape. And uh, with the distinction between map and territory, and I'm uh, interested to how the map gets to a feature of the territory that I know you alluded to in March 17, but uh, are there ways, and this is part of the territory that has preoccupied me. I had a teacher who used to say, we use religion as a crutch to lean on and to beat others with. And are there ways in which your map lends us to consider what's inherent in religious experience that uh, almost creates the conditions for it to be used in such diverse ways and in, in ways to harm as well as help? Is, is there some place in the map that orients us to say uh, there's something about these kinds of experiences that I don't think there's a location in the map where we find, say, religious violence or religious legitimations of violent acts. But um, in um, tracking down the uh, neurological and existential power of intense experiences, we come to understand how people get so attached to them, emotionally attached to them, habitually attached to them, and how social groups get built up out of that attachment. Uh, so you've got even something as simple as uh, a kind of closed-minded community orientation that refuses the outsider admittance. Right? Well, you can analyse that backwards to attachment to the very profound experiences ha people have of belonging to one another. So uh, in, in short, I sound like a Buddhist when I reply to your question like that. Get rid of attachment, you get rid of all of those problems. But you cannot... For example, you cannot solve problems or puzzles unless you have attachment. I'm not arguing for the elimination of attachment. Uh, I'm arguing for its monitoring and balancing with, uh, with uh, uh, other things where attachment is um, uh, dangerous. So, yes, I think it shows up in the, the differently modulated ways that the existential power of intensity grips us and causes us to cling to it. And protect it, nurture it, build groups around it, and so on. As soon as you've got a group, you've got trouble. I wonder if you could uh, review again uh, just why the five faces of intensity are faces of intensity rather than five really interesting different things mm. related. The phenomenological reason for thinking um, that they are uh, related to intensity, directly related to intensity, is that there is a pretty tight link between the reactions that we have to intensity that I described, the three pressures, and the way these factors modulate those reactions. So that's the argument of the paper. It's essentially a phenomenological one. The more interesting argument in the long run will be a neurological one. Um, I do think that there are different neurological uh, implications of each one of those five faces of intensity. So the class of intensity itself is diverse. 
It's not one thing. So the way to respond to your question at the deepest level is to deconstruct the unanimity of that intensity category. And yet, uh, the general statements that I made about it at their level, I think, are quite fine. But in practice, it's actually a collection of, uh, of skills that evolved probably in mutual co-conditioning ways uh, to give us the, um, the responses to it that we have. I thought your paradigm was lovely, very beautiful, very poetic. I'm really curious as to how you make a distinction between intensity and categories of emotion. Because I sort of noticed that there was a pattern throughout where you defined each category of intensity with specific kinds of emotions. Mm -hmm. And yet some of what I would categorize as emotions were not covered, like anger. Yes gratitude, things like that. So could you be more specific for me and what exactly you mean by intensity and how it contrasts with emotional experience? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, for one thing, they're different, but they overlap. So um, uh, uh, I think intensity, because it's, a, um, uh, it's connected to ultimacy experiences, has a kind of uh, a breadth of relevance that every aspect of our lives is joined into it, including emotions. Um, and then many emotions have very mundane forms that you wouldn't call intense at all, but they can be magnified in both ways. They need to be magnified in a strength of activation and in breadth or scope or something in order for them to be able to take on what I'm calling intense uh, dimensions. So gratitude, for example, can be very simple. If someone had brought me a glass of water, for example, I would have been uh, very grateful to them, but not really intensely grateful, whereas I'm so grateful for my wife's love that I can barely express it, right? Just to think about that is extremely intense. So that uh, um, uh, is, is a mar there's, there's some kind of transition that happens where an ordinary experience takes on significance that starts collecting other things together. So for example, when I have that feeling, I know how to treat her. When I have that feeling, I know how to think about the future. I know what my priorities are. I know who I am. I know what I'm ultimately committed to. Whereas when someone hands me the glass of water, it's a fairly mundane activity and doesn't leverage any of those connective, uh, connective ideas. Okay, so it sounds like you're talking about physiological activation as well as sort of a pulling together a gestalt sort of consciousness of where all, everything's sort of connected at the same time and yet it's energized in a very intense way. Mm -hmm. That's okay. the vertical and the horizontal dimension. And, and one of the untested claims, I argued that, that there's good prima facie evidence for it, but one of the untested claims is whether the neurological version of that story and the phenomenological version of that story, that is the experiential version of that story, really line up. And uh, I don't want to finesse that point. I was completely clear about the fact that, that there's prima facie evidence for it that's quite strong, but it still needs to be tested. If that fails, then the whole model would have to be adjusted. But um, I don't want to wait 10 years to talk about it. Uh, I want to talk about it now and then see how the hypothesis fares. So uh, what, have, what have you seen so far in terms of like the MRI stuff that's coming out with um, like Richie Davison's work yeah. and emotion? Is um, uh, I, I mentioned uh, Mario Beauregard uh, because he paid particular attention to, um, to experiences that were intense in my sense. That is, uh, um, existentially gripping experiences that were of ultimate significance to the people. In fact, he was scanning people using a variety of technologies who were remembering powerful experiences of prayer, nuns he was experiencing, uh, he was uh, scanning. And what he noticed and what he made a big deal about in his book was, and in his uh, publications, was that you not only have intense activation which you can measure, but it's extremely broad spread. Connects up a whole bunch of typically um, unconnected things and gives the lie to the sorts of studies of uh, intense experiences in the past which have often been focal experiences like meditation. A meditation experience often involves such a heavy use of the frontal cortex to focus attention that you actually limit 
uh, the, the breadth and spreading of, of connections, whereas typically ultimacy experiences do involve that breadth. And, and his, his data um, is quite persuasive on that point. But of course, everything needs to be replicated endlessly. One more question, sorry. Um, I, you started briefly to talk about feedback um, in terms of, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of cybernetic feedback processes. Um, have you run into anything in terms of the physiological, like from the self-organizing complexity sciences in terms of feedback loops and how they couple together that might be relevant here? Mm. Um, yes, but only in the most general way um, and as follows. Whenever you try and describe uh, a process of uh, complex emergence, uh, you need to have uh, um, stabilised uh, categories, toolkits, uh, neural circuits, or whatever they may be. And it's in the interaction of those stabilised units through feedback mechanisms that you actually are able to produce new stable elements. And uh, that, uh, this has been used to great effect by Terry Deacon uh, to explain the emergence of language, but he's used it since then to describe um, the emergence of, uh, of other things as well, including uh, conscious states and so on. So I, that's built in, all of that stuff is built into the conceptual framework whenever I use the word emergence, uh, uh, for me. It's a very rich and loaded topic, it involves information theory. My normal way of analysing it is using semiotic theory, but uh, it's, all, it's all there, um, but it, it can't be... Uh, Un unpacked. Okay, one last question. Yeah. Okay. So I love what you just said. And have you, in your uh, journeys, come to any particular ideas at all about where the different poles of emotion, the hedonic valence of emotion, by, might be related to these feedback dynamics? Uh, no, I have to. I have to take a pass on that. Um, I mean, I've read stuff on uh, on emotion, including some of Davidson's stuff, but. But um, no, I, don't, I haven't really thought about its connection to feedback mechanisms. I'd be happy to talk to you about that afterwards if you've got something to recommend. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more. Yeah, sure. uh, Wesley, that was a really impressive feat of um, what some philosophers call assemblage. Uh, and I was wondering, bricolage. Bricolage. Um, I was wondering if you could just comment a little bit on the method of doing phenomenology and how one uh, stays faithful to the uh, breadth and depth of experiences that you're trying to report on. Is there is there a trick to it? No. Uh, um, if if I was Edmund Husserl. I would say yes, and here it is, and I'd line you up, I'd put it up on the board, and I'd put you through classes for 10 years until you could do it just the way I can. Um, no one does phenomenology that way. I mean, it, it's a messy, intuitive process, and therefore it's usually done badly. So where do the controls on phenomenological description come from? I, th I think they come from uh, staying in touch with testable scientific hypotheses when you can find them, when you can articulate, and you cannot always articulate them. But to articulate them when you've got them, even if you can't test them, at least exposes the, the whole program to a kind of correction that I think is crucial for its intelligibility. And, but, but that said, the most important thing is an artistic sensitivity to experience that you only get by being old and grey and, uh, and working hard and reading a lot and, uh, you know, and falling in love and getting upset and angry and failing in life and everything else. I mean, to pay attention to your life, to be alert to what happens, is the most important asset of the phenomenologist. And I know it's not systematic. I know Husserl would be uh, wringing his, uh, his hair or whatever, wringing his hands and, and pulling his hair uh, to hear me say it like this, but no one can do what Husserl said we needed to do. So, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>